morning, everyone. This is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Um, we're here this morning first to chat with some of our business organizations about the Unemployment Trust Fund um, and um, to continue the discussions we started yesterday with the Department of Labor, um, just to see if we're um, on the right wavelength of uh, trying to make sure that we take care of the trust fund as best we can, but also uh, not trying to put too much pressure on businesses at this time. So with that, um, and then after uh, at 1130-ish, um, we'll be talking to Kevin Gaffney. He's the uh, deputy commissioner at the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, we asked him to um, take a look at the workers' comp uh, model um, during this COVID time to see if there may be a need for us to apply some uh, CRF dollars uh, as a backstop. Um, so that, that has been completed. So we've asked him in to just go over that report with us as well. So who would uh, like to go first? Bill, did you want to start off? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, uh, William Driscoll with Associated Industries of Vermont. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, talk about this issue. Uh, we have a long history of, of uh, trying to work on protecting and, and refining the UI, tr uh, UI system. Uh, we were very much involved in tw 2010 and the reforms that we put into place then. And um, it's, uh, it's an important issue. I think that's kind of brought home by by crises like we're in here now. Um, so I think I think yesterday's discussion framed a lot of the issues and some of the more immediate possible uh, approaches pretty well. I think just in terms of backing up and looking at what our ultimate goal would be that I think everybody can agree with is, you know, how do we in this, from where we are now, what's the best, best path toward restoring the health of the fund in a reasonable time frame with minimal shock uh, to employers. Uh, and I think in addition to some of the questions and runs that you guys were asking for yesterday, I think sort of talking over amongst uh, amongst our peers and whatnot, there's some some basic basic questions that I think would be uh, be important to look at and trying to frame frame the, some sort of response. I think the first question is what is what should the actual target be in terms of where we're going to restore the trust fund to? Where do we want it to get back to in terms of the level? I think it's fair to say that you know, at $500 million or so, the fund was uh, supercharged at the time that this crisis hit. Um, it may have been, for it was fortunate that it was in, in some ways over, over, uh, overcharged in a way, given the magnitude of the hit it took but that's not necessarily to say that, that that should be the ultimate goal is to get back to say 500 million. I think it should be a good discussion as to what the, what the target solvency should be uh, for the fund um, in order to be able to survive what might be the next uh, normal, if you will, recession uh, and the other stresses that naturally come to the fund. Um, and then the next question after that is how quickly do we want to get to that level? Uh, and this raises some issues. I don't know if uh, if Matt with the department might have some thoughts on this. It's it's a, it's a it's an inherently difficult uh, task to try to forecast recessions. But I think there's a the question out there as to, given the unusual nature of the of the economic situation we're in right now, being caused by a pandemic as opposed to the uh, natural sort of you know ebb and flow of the economy. Are we looking at a situation where we're restarting the traditional assumptions in terms of the clock about when we might expect another recession and therefore when do we want to have the trust fund at our target level? Or is this, is this economic crisis existing independent of what is otherwise going to be the cycles of recessions, which were in a way kind of overdue already uh, when this hit? Um, I think those are questions that might be difficult to answer, certainly with any certainty, but I think those are the kind of things uh, be good to get some feedback from from experts in terms of informing when you want to where you want to set our path to get to 
our solvency goal uh, in a reasonable amount of time. And I think once you get those two questions of where you want to go and when you want to get there, then you can sort of see how gently we could uh, adjust that revenue path uh, to avoid uh, to avoid shocks on, on the employers that are going through uh, the experiences that they are right now. Um, and uh, you know, beyond that, getting into sort of the fine-tuned questions, uh, I'm not, I don't know off the top of my head if it, what kind of differences there are, but in looking at the two, the two mechanisms or the two tools uh, that you've discussed so far, and either adjusting the change between tax schedules or and or adjusting the taxable wage base, uh, it'd be good to double check whether and to what extent uh, either of those two changes have a different distribution of effect or distribution of cost on employers uh, based on what their experience ratings are. Um, and you could come up with arguments, I think initially pro or con, whether you want the cost of this to be borne more or less by employers who have a greater or lesser uh, experience rating in terms of having layoff, uh, a history of layoffs. Uh, for whatever reason, um, not so. That's not to make a recommendation as to which way that 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 uh, that distribution should be should be moved. But I think it's a it's a good question to ask and a good information to have on hand when you make that decision. Um, and then finally, I, I just raised this just because I think it's it, it's an it's an inevitable question as you actually come up with legislation as to whether how how temporary you want these changes to be. Um, you know, I think, again, uh, the trust fund was at a very supercharged level going into this crisis. That might suggest that the tax mechanisms are, are more aggressive than they have to be. But then on the other hand, uh, I think people could argue that we were kind of overdue for a recession normally anyway. So that may explain why the trust fund was so high. Um, I think that we would generally recommend not making um, uh, fundamental permanent changes to uh, either the uh, tax schedules or the taxable wage base. Um, I would think it'd probably be good to uh, tailor the response to just kind of adjusting that initial that initial track to our to the target solvency, um, and then leave. Uh, maybe more fundamental reforms uh, for a later date when we have maybe more time and perspective to sort of analyze what happened over the last 10 years and what happened, uh, what happened in this immediate crisis. So I think those are just some of the questions or issues that I think would be good for the committee to get feedback on to sort of frame, frame what I think is a fairly straightforward uh, goal that, that, it, that it seems like everybody, uh, everybody uh, is in general agreement with. Okay, any questions for Bill? Thanks, Bill. Oh, <clears throat> Zach. Sorry, Mike, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, trying to find my raise hand. Um, Bill, uh, you, you, you keep on saying a couple times that the, the trust fund is supercharged. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit of, about um, where you're hearing that that it's supercharged and, and why it would be supercharged. I, it was supercharged in the, in the sense that it was in the $500 million range, which uh, now it's been a few years and obviously inflation can have a certain effect, but I know when we were looking at uh, restoring the fund, uh, you know, in 2010 and shortly after, I think the general assumption, not that, not that it was complete agreement always, always in terms of where you want your target solvency to be, but I think it was more in the range of 360 or, or a million or something like that. 500 million is much more money on hand than you would normally need to have. Um, and so you don't need that sort of an aggressive tax um, income in order to sustain that level of a fund. Now, obviously the system is designed to be self-correcting as was uh, in the process of happening in terms of the tax schedule going down to one and the scheduled $2,000 drop in the taxable wage, ba wage base uh, scheduled for January. 
Now, how long that may have taken to sort of bring that 500 million down to a more reasonable level, uh, yeah, I'm sure Matt can have runs that what what could have been, but that's what I mean by supercharged. It was it was at a very it was at a unnecessarily high level right before this crisis hit. And I so and what that's relevant to I think now is if you're looking at how you're going to adjust your tax tax revenues coming in. Uh, going forward and where you want to go, I I don't think, um, certainly if folks feel otherwise and can make an argument, be very interested in hearing it, I don't think that we should be shooting to get back to $500 million. And the reason I ask is just because we're, we're not through this yet. So we actually don't even know if $500 million is going to be enough. Um, you know, we're halfway through it and we're not even through the year yet. So I, I think that the assumption that we're somehow supercharged when the recession hasn't even actually hit yet is, is a false assumption until we actually know, when, until we get out of this. I mean, we are in the best position arguably in the whole country. And I think our Department of Labor uh, has done a phenomenal job in making sure that we've got enough funds in the bank. So I, I think that the phrase that this somehow is supercharged is, is, is political and, and um, who knows where we're actually how much money we're actually going to need, um, right? Which is why, which is why I led off with that first important point. And again, just to be clear, I would say it was supercharged. It's certainly not supercharged now that it's been reduced by some forty percent. The question is, it was supercharged before. Um, the question is now that we're trying to look at how we're going to change the pace of revenues coming in. What is the appropriate target that we should be shooting for? Lynn. Thank you. Um, when I was here in 2009 and 10 and we worked on this, I believe it was at $350 million or something in that range. And it was, it had been going down. I mean, we saw that. Uh, that was because we indexed the benefits, but we didn't index the, the taxable wage base over a period of time previous. Uh, but 350 or $360 million was considered pretty good. Um, we were at schedule three and, um, and my experience as an employer who paid these taxes is that schedule three was probably the norm. That's where it had been for a long time. And that's probably as low as I could see it ever getting. And then after we went through the great bargain and came up with the things that we came up with um, and we went to schedule five, obviously, because we were in the red and borrowing money from the feds. Um, I remember thinking that we would probably never get to schedule one. It just seemed impossible from my personal experience that we would get that much. Um, but the problem also was that we had negative balance employers, a lot of negative balance employers, seasonal employees who were constantly taking out more money than anybody was putting in and raising, one of the issues that came up was raising the taxable wage base was a really important part of this. Uh, we obviously were decoupled from the um, the automatic indexing of the benefits while we were borrowing money from the feds, and we had to stop doing that, and we had to get ourselves back into the, the black, but the um, taxable wage base, from what I recall, was that when we raised that taxable wage base, we ended up solving, maybe not all of them, but a lot of the problems we had with the negative balance employers. Um, and I remember in the next administration, uh, when we had other issues that we had to talk about, such as the Irene uh, repercussions for employers, is that uh, the, the, the commissioner of labor came in and announced that probably 250,000 was about what we needed. That's where we would probably start to see um, where we back on stable ground. Obviously we've gone way beyond that. Um, I thought 250 was probably a little low, but that was what, she pointed out as our goal. So I don't know, you know, if we still have, um, you know, there was a lot of discussion in those two years that we worked on this about how could we, how could we uh, not shock the employers and yet get the thing back as quickly as possible or in a steady, slow rise up to where we could be solvent again and, and rebuild that, 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 uh, that fund. And it sounds like we did pretty well. 
Uh, we made a couple of exceptions, like I say, during Irene. Um, and we expanded a couple of things that were just sort of nibbling around the edges, but we did okay. Uh, I don't think 500 million is necessary, personally. I mean, it's great to go back to schedule one, but you know, I'm not sure if that's a normal place for us to be or if we should be more like schedule two or three. I don't know, but it's, um, I don't know. I mean, I'd like to hear some of the other representatives uh, about what's the retail people are gonna be hit by this and the, the hospitality industry and the chambers are gonna be hit by this, their members. So it will be interesting to see where we end up. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, uh, you know, you pointed out that uh, uh, 500 million was unnecessarily high. Um, and had we not been Jim, hit with the, uh, yeah. yeah. Jim, um, I don't believe Bill's a commissioner. Oh, okay, sorry. Maybe he's, maybe he's trying out for it, I'm not sure. Well, I think, we could, I think you could sell tickets to that confirmation hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm uh, perhaps I'm uh, pushing up your pay grade, but nevertheless, the question, it. Is, uh, the question is, you know, had we not had this uh, unnecessarily high amount of money, um, let's say 300 million, and uh, we got hit with 200 million, we'd be down to 100 million. Now, let's say, you know, if we had kept it at 300, 350 million, and we go to uh, a second hit, um, with COVID-19, where is that going to put us? Right, and, th and those are the kind of questions that you want to you want to ask and try to do some runs with the department to, to see where you want to be. And, you know, um, generally those sort of solvency goals, again, and, you know, there's a, there's a range of, of, I don't know if you want to call it uh, risk, risk aversion or acceptance in terms of where people tend to come down. I think, you know, historically we've, and certainly coming out of 2010, I think we kind of leaned a little bit on the higher side of what solvency should be. And again, you know, looking at the, you know, whether it's 360 or in the 200s or something like that. Um, but there are, there are formulas that, are, that you use in terms of the historical experience um, to kind of figure out Okay, if we're gonna get if we're gonna be hit a recession in the next two years, you know how much do we need to have going into that in order to, you know, obviously there'll be a big dip, but we'll have had that sort of self-correcting system kind of weather that. Um, so yeah, no, absolutely uh, factoring in whether we have a whether the COVID effect is prolonged, or again, as I as I brought up before, are we looking at there could be a, a what we might call a natural recession any moment now that we were kind of overdue for perhaps after after uh, 2008, um, or are we kind of resetting the clock in terms of our expectations and we may not expect another recession for a number of years down the road? Again, those are not questions I, I those are questions I can pose. I'm not going to be able to answer those. I think Matt and others may be able to draw upon what what sort of thought folks have given to that around the country. Um, and then that will inform, though, uh, how what your pace of revenues you want you want in order to get to that sort of solvency target in a reasonable amount of time uh, to be prepared for the next hit. So that we, so we're not back here again with a, with a, with more shocks coming uh, swiftly on people, but but also um, being able to sort of moderate that revenue flow uh, to get there in a way that, that causes the least amount of disruption right now. So do you have a, a, a recommended level of solvency? I, I do not. I, I, I would like, I think, I don't think it would be difficult for the department to um, look at the sort of the, the traditional formulas and, and translate that into now. Like I was saying, I think 10 years ago, I think we were looking at, at something in the 300, 300 range. And again, that may be updated now. Um, uh, but that, that's, that's, that's the normal, that, that's, that is squarely in the, in the uh, bailiwick of, of the department to be able to provide, uh, provide some guidance on. Thank you. Yeah. Stephanie. I was just going to 
say that I, mean, I think these are pretty obvious questions that I'm sure Matt Barowitz has thought of and is looking into. And I think it's a, a certainly a good idea to see what our optimal amount is going forward, sort of the safest amount, so that we don't have to uh, put a increase our tax the taxable amount for businesses, um, especially in this time the next year. I mean, this is going to be a tough time for every business. So. That and I'm sure that um, Matt will also be looking at the other states who are doing well and what their uh, what their level is and and I think that there can be some sort of definitely be some sort of goal that we can come up with that would be worthy of a discussion. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Okay, any more questions for Bill? Bob. Uh, it it strikes me that the question is. Are we going to set a reserve based on anticipated recessions or are we going to bake in a pandemic? Um, obviously, if we bake in a pandemic, then, uh, you know, 500 million is probably an appropriate figure. But if we um, believe that's an anomaly and that what we're really concerned with, as we have been in the past up until this year, um, uh, being able to have sufficient funds to, um, and the trust fund um, to cover uh, unemployment co uh, compensation in a period of recession, then I think maybe the 500 is a little on the high side. If, if I wasn't quite sure uh, the numbers, I thought somebody said 360,000 was the, was the, um, the number that people um, uh, were talking about in 2010, uh, you know, uh, uh, wages have gone up a good 20% uh, over that 10 year period. So if it was 360 back then, uh, that would bring us up to about 430 million. Yeah, and uh, you know, I wanna be, so 360 was just a general idea back then. And that was, I think, to be fair, that was on the high side of what a lot of other folks were were sort of throwing around. Um, again, I think I think it's it's something that the department could certainly speak to. The one thing I would add, add, add you raise a very good point on when we if we are trying to look at what our goal should be, where do we put this down this COVID downturn into that context and. Um, Again, you know, folks may have different thoughts on this. It, it would seem to me, it'd be my inclination that you do not need, to, it, it would not be advisable to build up the fund to be able to withstand a COVID style economic shutdown in, in, in any given year. Um, you know, whether it's gonna be another hundred years before we have a pandemic, um, you know, maybe not that long, but it's not, I don't, I think it's fair to say it's not gonna be with the frequency that you have uh, regular recession cycles. And also, I mean, say what you will about the gridlock in Washington right now in terms of responding to this. Um, I think it's also fair to say and fair to factor in that however many years it may be from now that you have something like this, so it's not like a regular recession, but something really truly dramatic and national that Vermont would not be addressing it entirely on its own, that there would be uh, federal assistance or federal uh, involvement. Um, not, obviously we can't you know, predict exactly what that's gonna be or guarantee that, but I think if you're looking at, at um, especially in the context of trying not to overburden the economy now by trying to really raise a lot of revenue in the short term, um, I, I I would think it'd be advisable to not set your target based on another COVID shutdown. It would be based on on trying to survive the next uh, next normal, for lack of a better way of saying it, recession in a reasonable amount of time. Jean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just want to echo something Bob just talked about when he was talking about wages having gone up about 20%, that while we're discussing 300, 500, we're talking about absolute numbers. 
I would urge us to think of them as a percentage of gross payroll. And what does that percentage look like? Not what those dollar figures look like, because you're looking at a 10, 10 year old, uh, 10 year old numbers and we're bringing them forward into, into the current discussion. So I, because we have an economist on our committee, I'd urge us to look at the relative, it's how the relative numbers and the reserves play out to the base core of the employ of, of the total net of wages paid to Vermonters, because that's a better market. And that, and I think as we go forward, we using that metric will be help, more helpful. And I think with a pandemic, you have both a rapid decline and a, and a very and and a a, re, a somewhat more rapid recovery. So, while I agree that we need to have a large enough reserve that should a pandemic hit, we're not like the other states. And I think we've handled ourselves very well. At the same time, we really have to look at this in the longer term and context of recovery. And what does recovery look like? And where where are the optimal numbers for us relative to the number of employees, relative to our population, relative to our wage growth? growth. It's just a way of looking at the numbers. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question that we'll work with the department on. Um, and something that we really need to think about is um, should our trust fund, we continue to look at it as something that we have reserves for a uh, recession that happens? Um, do we need to, and, and I think there's going to be some thought or some feelings that maybe we blend something that, that helps a little bit um, if something like this happens again in the next 10 years or whatever, we don't know. Um, I'm not sure. And, and I think some of it's going to come down from the federal government, from, from the federal DOL on their recommendations to us as well. Um, but certainly we have been fortunate that we did have this amount of money <clears throat> in reserves. Um, so Bill, thank you very much. Um, appreciate it, and um, we want to. We'll make sure that um, we have you and and everyone else on board uh, when we discuss this again with the department. Aaron, um, would you like to just talk a little bit about our our um, association of retailing retailing grocers and um, what that might mean for them um, going forward? Yeah. Um Aaron Segrist, uh, president of the Vermont Retail and Grocers Association. Um, first, I want to thank the committee for allowing the opportunity to speak. Um, we certainly appreciate the conversation about proactively um, addressing solvency in the UI Trust Fund. Um, I think that I, I will echo Bill's comment about what, what is the solvency goal. I think that we need to uh, see the numbers and, and continue to work with the Department of Labor um, here in Vermont, but also as, as the chair just shared um, at the federal level on, on what that number looks like and what, what we should be shooting for. Um, I was not part of, or I was not here um, when the grand bargain was uh, settled upon 10 years ago, so I don't have all of the backstory for that. but. But I do think um, we do need to uh, look at, at uh, the today, not not what what we noticed or decided on ten years ago. Um, I would strongly encourage not only working with the Department of Labor, but maybe having um, some healthcare professionals weigh in to to help us anticipate what what we can be looking forward to. Um, whether this is a 100 year event or a 50 year event, or I think having that information will help us make some educated um, decisions as well. Um, I do wanna share also employers, as you know, will be struggling to come out of the, the COVID-19 impact for years. Um, nationally, uh, retail is seeing about a 20% loss 
in business. I don't anticipate that Vermont will see a 20% loss in retail, but I, I do anticipate double digits. And so we need to take that into consideration as well. Um, if businesses are struggling to come out of, of this pandemic financially um, today, they will certainly be struggling to come out of it uh, next year as well. And so we, we do need to keep in, touch, keep in mind um, you know, the, the significant losses that, that the country and the state may be facing. Um, I do appreciate Representative O'Sullivan's comment about um, the percentage of gross payroll. I think that that's certainly something that we should also take into consideration. So appreciate that comment. Um, uh, the other piece, of course, that we do continue to stress is, is just the fluctuation. If there is a way that we can get to um, a, an ideal solvency goal, uh, to keep employers um, within the one to three, uh, the schedule one to schedule three, instead of um, ending up at a schedule one and then jumping to a schedule five, the, the tripling of, of costs for um, unemployment is certainly untenable if we continue, continue to see those fluctuations. I unfortunately do not have numbers from members yet, but um, I, I have reached out to members to see what that impact would look like um, financially, but uh, I'm happy to continue the conversation. I'm looking forward to hearing from the department after they um, present their runs. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of the conversation as we continue to move forward. Happy to take questions as well. Thanks, Aaron. Any questions for Aaron? Okay, great. Thank you. Charles? Thank you. Uh, Charles Martin, Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you to the committee for having me here today. Um, I suppose it pays to go third in the pecking order when the two witnesses before you are more or less stating the testimony you were going to deliver. Um, I think all the questions that were raised are definitely uh, pertinent. Um, central to this conversation is if with this UI fund, we're trying to create a fund that mitigates disaster and pandemic or a fund that mitigates the recession circumstances and economic decline. Um, I don't know that I would feel comfortable saying, you know, what level that fund should be at. Um, I don't know that, you know, that's a determination I can make. I'd leave that to the state economists. But I do think it's sort of two different conversations. Um, and I know in 2020, depending on the feds, uh, can be kind of a daunting prospect. Uh, but typically speaking, for disasters and things like pandemics, the feds do kick in additional emergency appropriations that seem to mitigate to a degree some of the concerns uh, that we have in the UI front and other fronts in the state. Um, I'd echo what uh, Aaron said, uh, moving from Schedule 1 to Schedule 5, as I think Cameron mentioned, would triple taxes is also sort of a daunting prospect. Um, with all that said, seasonal layoffs this year are certainly going to be a lot worse um, because typically speaking, in the hospitality sector, you don't see seasonal layoffs um, occur quite to the degree that they're about to occur in the uh, food services industry. Um, and that's going to be just a result of capacity and not having outdoor dining. There won't be enough staff. There will be less staff to justify um, the, uh, the decrease throughput of customers based on all the Sort of restrictions that'll still be in place uh, this fall when things cool down so it's definitely something to consider um but i think yeah again you know i won't i won't go on and on and restate what the previous witnesses stated uh but i, I do think we just need to determine uh what a healthy what healthy solvency is in the ui fund and then you know have a justification that can be communicated to employers as to why that that is an absolutely necessary threshold um, that justifies the corresponding schedule increase or, or not. Um, I guess I'll leave it there uh, rather than going through all of Aaron and Bill's testimony again. Thank you. I think we all appreciate that. Any, uh, any questions for Charles? Great, thanks. Matt, anything to add? Yes, thanks for having me. Uh, Matt Musgrave with the Associated General Contractors. And uh, I promise to not repeat what the other folks just said, but I am in a full agreement with them on that, uh, particularly on uh, changing the schedule. I mean, if, if, if it was me, I would 
be supportive of something below three. Uh, when we get above three, I would start to get a little prickly about that. Um, but I think, you know, to to some of the points I think we're looking at here, it's it's really two different issues going on. Um, I'm not a I'm not an expert economist. I'm not going to suggest what I think the appropriate rate would be at, but it seemed like 500 million was satisfactory for this situation. Um, but what we're also dealing with right now is we're paying these benefits through a unique situation right now to Vermont employees, and it's not based on a recession on our due to the way our economy is operating, which is what we were expecting was an, a, a recession based on our economy. And now we have one that's based on a natural disaster. Um, and that's that's put people out uh, out of work. And some of those people aren't going to come back to work. I mean, it's it's just a, a unfortunate fact of the situation um, that we're going to be looking at two issues here. One is today we're talking about uh, unemployment benefits, which unemployment, as I understand it, is really a temporary vehicle to get you from either a layoff or unfair termination um, to your next uh, income opportunity. It's, it's supposed to be a vehicle to get you from point A to point B. When we're looking at the pandemic, this is a, this is a human service issue um, and, and we might be well suited. I know that they have a lessons learned uh, uh, conversation going on in another committee, but this may be one of the lessons learned that we need to look at separating our unemployment system from what really is a human service for a lot of these folks that aren't gonna come back to work. Um, so that's that's one point, it's, it's we're looking at two completely different things and it's really hard to forecast, forecast health and the economy at the same time. So I really appreciate uh, DOL, Matt, Matt left the call, but thanks Matt uh, for, for being able to tr wade through that. But on a, on a personal note from my association right now, uh, when I have the conversation with anybody about increasing expenses anywhere, uh, it's just, it's falling flat. And when we talk about tripling rates for, for unemployment, uh, particularly for contractors, um, and I'm unfortunately not well versed in the other verticals that spoke on the call today, uh, but our industry is generally based on a bid and proposal system. Um, so if you have a system that is based on bid and proposals, uh, not only are you getting Vermont bidders on those projects, but you're getting people from around the state and around the country that are also bidding on those, those projects. And we understand uh, full well that when an out-of-state employer brings labor into Vermont, they're, they're actually paying Vermont income taxes, and, and that's great, which is also a component of our UI. But the rest of their year out of state, they're able to pay at the rate they are in their other states. So I would be cautious to look at what kind of parity we have with other states, because if it's less expensive for me to operate my business over in New York, do 75% of my work over there, and maybe do a quarter of my work over here, I can come undercut Vermont uh, bids because the, I'm, I'm paying maybe a lower rate over there. I, I don't know what the rates are in New York. What I'm suggesting is we wanna look at uh, some sort of a parity so that we don't have a huge uh, disparity over state lines. Um, and then the last thing, you know, we're looking at, uh, a, we're tracking right now a 12 to a 13% uh, reduction in construction for the year in Vermont, and we're estimating that it's going to go to 15. I cannot tell you what's going to happen next year. I'm relatively confident that we're still going to uh, have transportation dollars for roads and bridges, uh, but in private construction and commercial construction, I can't, I have no way of knowing what's going to happen over the next two years. Um, because we're seeing the workforce is changing to tele-remote work. Some businesses aren't opening. Some plans that had been uh, started have now fallen by the wayside. So I would urge caution for the committee. Uh, if it's something that we can wait through the end of the year to make a decision on, um, that would give us some more information as to what to expect within the economy. That might be the most prudent solution, uh, but uh, our request would be to uh, please just consider that there's a lot of one, 2% increases that employers are bearing right now as a result of COVID, whether it's PPE, whether it's loss of productivity, loss of efficiency, every 2% or 3% conversation that we have is already coming from a pot that's really run dry for at least this year and probably years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Any questions for Matt? 
Okay, thank you. Uh, last is um, someone on the other side of the aisle um, representing labor. Um, David, um, do you have anything to add to this discussion that we've been having? Um, very brief. Thank you for having me. I like to think we're all in the same in the same theater. So um, trying to work towards a common goal um, and appreciate love to hear that. <laughs> well, I appreciate the pressures that are on employers right now. And um, and we also, I think, can take a moment to appreciate how important the UI program is. And I know that this committee has spent a lot of time uh, on that and can appreciate that it was the, the thing that saved many people's lives and injected much needed uh, money back into the economy. Um, uh, in terms of what you're discussing now, again, I think um, a couple of points. One, I think we do have to rely on the department to, to a great extent to uh, guide us in uh, helping to determine what, in fact, the right level is of risk. Obviously, if the program, if the UI fund is under uh, underfunded, at risk benefit cuts, uh, benefit cuts at a time would be really devastating for folks. So we want to certainly avoid that. Um, a couple of, of points um, related to that, I think it was Representative Sullivan said, mentioned yesterday, there may be sectors of our economy that are actually, that are actually booming and, and being very successful right now. And the question is, can you parse them out? Unlikely, but it's just something to consider for those employers that are actually doing quite well, um, whether there's a, an ability to parse that out um, and see if there's a possibility to, to not perhaps change the rules of the game for them, um, given that they're, they're benefiting uh, during this time. And then another question, not for this bill, but for, or not for this, this immediate time, but something to, be, to consider and something which is being discussed all over the country. And it really came it sort of laid bare uh, during this time is whether or not the state is actually collecting what it should be from those that should be paying into the UI trust fund. So for instance, we've had a long time discussion about transportation network companies and states all over the country now are looking at whether in fact they should be paying into the UI trust fund. And so as we talk about the pressure on Vermont employers, there's a question, and right now our policy based on transportation network companies is based on a three, three or four page memo that the Department of Labor put out a few years ago saying that, um, that they are not employers. So that's the basis for it. But um, I guess when we look to, to all uh, sort of work together to solve this problem, we have to look to see whether some major employers who otherwise should be paying into the fund uh, are not. So that's something to consider uh, as you wade through these difficult waters. Um, I will agree with my, my previous uh, um, the witnesses to say, I don't know what the exact amount is, whether it's 300, 400, 500 million, that's sufficient. Obviously the concern from our perspective representing employees um, uh, is uh, that if the fund becomes dangerously low, then benefit cuts are right around the corner. So um, I'll pause there. I guess I should say David Mickenberg on behalf of Working Vermont. Thanks for thanks for letting me testify um, today. So thank you, David. Any questions for David? All right. I think um, I think we have two issues in front of us right now. The first issue is making sure that currently the trust fund stays as healthy as possible without, um, without putting undue stress on, on our business community. Um, and I think that's a short-term um, discussion that we need to have uh, with the department and with you all. Um, the long-term discussion um, after we uh, come back maybe in January, if we have better data, um, we may not. Um, but I think the next discussion is, you know, where, where's our target? Um, you know, is it 360, 400? I don't know. Um, but I, I think that's a, that's a really um, pretty good sized policy discussion that we need to have. Um, so I don't, I don't anticipate us 
weighing in in those waters right now. Um, I think it's the the short term issue that we have with, um, with the trust fund and the uh, schedule jumping from one to five. Um, so if there's a way that we can um, lower that uh, that schedule jump um, and still maintain uh, the, the trust fund um, to make sure that it stays uh, semi healthy at least, then I think um, I think we've done a good job for now. Lynn. Yeah, thank you. Um, when we talk about gross payroll and the wages of Vermonters, um, DOL should have all that information. And um, David Mecklenburg's uh, discussion about some sectors being, I mean, and Jean's discussion about some of those being more, being more successful during this period of time than others. Some of that is related to uh, what you pay anyway. Um, you know, there is a taxable wage base and you only pay on that. But the more people you have employed and the more money they have, the, 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 the business pays out, the more likely you are to collect more money from them for the UI fund. And the people who have uh, more layoffs and, and a declining business, their experience rating is affected. Um, and so it's, it's sort of built in there. It'd be nice to hear what Matt has to say about how those things relate, because it seems to me there is a factor in there that's already accommodating that. I don't know exactly how that can be changed or adjusted, but um, you know, it, it's something that we need to hear from Matt and look at how the DOL determines that. Yeah, I think if we all remember um, when we left in March um, and then ultimately passed the bill that, that was sent back over from, from Senate Economic Development on UI, um, that we did have a, a uh, we let the experience rating, um, we that. gave a pause to that. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe it's still paused right now. So that's not affecting um, the businesses at this point, um, which is a good thing, but it will, will affect the trust fund. Um, yes, and I will say as an employer that we would never have put all these people on unemployment in a situation unless it was something like this. You know, this was um, employer, you know, we would have had some other way of compensating people, but there wasn't any cash flow because you couldn't make any money. And so whether it was a retail or something else, you really, you had to depend upon UI as an employer in a way that you would normally never do. And the, the uh, you know, not resuming, not, not counting in the experience rating made it possible for people to actually do that to get money into the hands of their employees, which was good for the employees and good for the employers. And it was a win-win. Yep. Um, but a lot of employers wouldn't have done that. They would have just, I don't know what they would have done, but they didn't have the cash flow and they didn't have, they would not, they would be really burdened if they had like 10 or 12 or 25 people that had to be laid off and have that impact their experience rating when they're not used to it. Yeah, yeah. it won't just, again, realize that it won't affect the your experience rating until July of next year, July 1. So you did have a one year pass, but we did, we did relieve the experience ratings on everyone um, during this period. Um, any other questions or comments from the committee before we, we move to our next subject matter? Okay, great. Thank you very much all for joining us and I invite you to stay on and listen in to our discussion with Kevin and, and Steve Monahan um, on the workers' comp uh, um, funding possibility and, and the report that Kevin's going to, uh, going to give us. And Cameron, thank you for being on with us this morning so you could listen in to the discussion. Hope it was helpful. Yes, sir, it was. Thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate all the the conversation from everybody, and you know, we're we're looking forward to to coming back. And uh, you know, I took a few notes, and hopefully, we'll be able to provide some more information. Uh, you know, once we're back, hopefully later this week. Sounds good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Kevin, good morning. Thank you for taking time to come and give us your report on the workers' comp. We appreciate it. I think uh, everyone had the report earlier and uh, Amy has just posted it to our 
web page and uh, I think she sent it to the committee again. Very good. Uh, for the record, Kevin Gaffney, Deputy Commissioner of Insurance at the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, the uh, department undertook this study um, after the passage of Act 150. Uh, and, um, and I just, before I get into the report, I just want to thank um, not only our staff, uh, Jill Rickard, uh, Director of policy and uh, Rosemary Raska and Pat Burry and my staff. This was a, you know, a rather extensive report for the time that we had. So um, appreciate their, their diligence and work and, and um, but also want the committee to appreciate that, you know, we, we had a certain time frame to get this done. So we tried to capture and answer, I think as many of the questions or at least raise as many of the issues that um, maybe perhaps allow the committee to make uh, certain decisions. So I want to thank them and also want to thank um, just the other agencies, Department of Labor, the Department of Health, um, um, the, the Office of Risk Management, uh, the, the Intermunicipal Trust. There's a lot of, uh, lot of input and uh, feedback and work that we did. And everyone was very responsive to assisting the department and getting that information together. Um, so I, uh, the, the, um, the report is kind of broken down into six sections. Um, and I think I'll, um, I'm happy to go through, um, go through each section. I probably will um, focus on certain sections more that are germane to the key issues, but uh, I guess I'll just allow the committee to stop me if they have questions or certainly ask questions at the end. Um, so in, um, in section one, the summary, I just wanna just cover the, um, the charge that we undertook here in doing the report. Uh, one was to determine the average cost of, of paying a COVID-19 related workers comp claim in Vermont. Uh, what factors influence those costs of uh, COVID-19 claims, including medical costs, uh, average time a worker may be out of work, uh, any applicable deductibles, and then the other factors. Um, and also the third item is the potential impacts on uh, experience modifiers for employers uh, based on Vermont and other states, uh, um, COVID-19 infection rates. And um, so I will get into that in section three. Um, and uh, the fourth is the amount of funding uh, and any legislative acts to be necessary to substantially mitigate or eliminate the impact of COVID-19. Um, and then the requirements for structuring such a fund uh, so that the monies from the uh, CARES Act can be used in compliance with uh, the appropriate sections of the act. Um, so I already uh, kind of discussed, but I'll just go through all the stakeholders that we did engage with. Um, certainly uh, as the, um, you know, uh, the workers' compensation insurance is regulated in a bifurcated manner, I would say really the lion's share of it is, is regulated by the Department of Labor in terms of the, uh, the administration of workers' compensation claims. Obviously, the Department of Financial Regulation um, uses a lot of that information, the output of claim results and all in reviewing uh, rates and reviewing uh, forms. Um, we did uh, reach out to the Department of Health uh, because it was helpful um, in, in the midst of this pandemic to get the, pers the, the broader perspective of the COVID-19 um, uh, on the, just the general population in Vermont as we then assessed the impact on uh, workers in Vermont. Uh, and then additionally, we, we, um, we will discuss in the report to the extent that um, many of the uh, um, employment types uh, that are addressed in this act are often through either self-insured uh, arrangements or intermunicipal trusts, and they they present a, um, a, a meaningful, if not a, a, a majority share of the workers' comp market. 
Um, we also consulted with our National Association of Insurance Commissioners and the National uh, Council on Compensation Insurance, uh, NCCI, which is the advisory service organization that establishes um, the rates and, and loss costs and uh, forms for use in Vermont. But more importantly, um, as a response to this pandemic, developed a, um, a COVID-19 modeling tool that the department used in their, in their report. Um, uh, I, think, I think folks are generally familiar with the um, workers' compensation system in Vermont. Um, um, so I will, um, I will just, uh, if there's questions about section two, I'll be happy to address those. I guess what I would, would highlight is just the components of a workers' compensation claim are, um, you know, the uh, medical and voc, voc rehab um, expenses, right, that uh, someone may incur if they have a work-related injury, the indemnity portion of their loss, which is their lost wages, which will obviously be dependent on their uh, wage level and the state, um, state uh, rules around wage replacement. Um, and then in the case of a serious event of death, uh, the, the death, the bur burial and funeral expenses and survivor benefits that the system provides. And, and like many states, uh, I think it's 38 states, uh, Vermont utilizes NCCI as the advisory service organization. Um, so they do provide the backdrop. There's some states that have their own um, mon monopolistic uh, system, but most states utilize NCCI. So in, in item uh, three, uh, in section three, uh, we, did, we just wanted to capture for the committee um, the uh, infection uh, rate of infection in Vermont and just uh, capture from a, a, a broader scale the, um, the total number of cases. Obviously, uh, this is a moving target. So I'm just reporting to you what we, what we had as of the, the date we reported this. Um, so in Vermont, as of the August 14th, we had 1,501 confirmed cases. Uh, which represented 0.24% uh, of the total population. Um, I think the many um, um, uh, model estimates estimate that the ultimate, uh, that, the, uh, that the actual percentage of Vermonters infected is close to 2%, which is about seven times uh, what we have as reported. Um, and then we did also get additional information from um, uh, a data scientist, uh, uh, Yu Yang Gu, who um, is with MIT and the CDC and their ensemble utilizes much of his data that utilizes machine learning uh, also, as well as Harvard. And uh, Dr. Gu had estimated that the total infections in Vermont would grow to 3% by November 1st. Um, so, um, workers' compensation claims, um, in, I'm on the top of page seven, just for the committee members that are following the report. Um, we did summarize and, and did get this input, uh, directly from the Department of Labor. Um, as maybe many of you do know, but in case you don't, all employers are required to, to file a first report of injury. And certainly uh, Steve Monahan can talk to labor's role better than I, um, but we thought it was helpful to get this input from labor. So we'd have kind of a, a, a level set of the claims to date. And so uh, there's a chart there that outlines the first reports, 156 claims. Um, 65 of those are denied, um, 11 paid without prejudice, um, uh, and, and oftentimes, I would let Steve explain that in more detail, but oftentimes there's, just, there's payments made at the initial outset to address medical expenses before um, the, um, the, care, the insurance carrier will actually 
uh, accept the claim uh, just to just as uh, um, a goodwill. Um, uh, and we have six claims accepted. So there, the remainder of those are still open claims. Um, the average cost, uh, so um, in, in section four, we, we get into the cost, uh, the claims costs and the factors and, the, and our projections. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the, the cost, the average cost in, in the insurance terms is really called claim severity. So I may reference claim severity. So the impact on claim severity uh, are items like how long someone is hospitalized, uh, the type and volume of medical services provided, particularly if there's any critical care or uh, prescription drugs, the employer employee's average weekly wage and the amount of time the employee is unable to work, and whether that illness actually results in any partial or, or total disability or, or is fatal. Um, so in, again, I'm at the bottom of page seven of the report, um, of the claims reported, uh, the average incurred loss was uh, about $7,500. Uh, that average paid, the average um, paid loss was uh, almost $3,900, and the average reserve totaled approximately $3,600. And on the top of page eight, um, while most of, while those averages are re re reflect relatively low claims costs, that is the case. We've seen ninety percent of these claims are mild in nature. We do have at least one uh, that uh, is pay paid out um, one hundred fifty thousand and has a reserve of over fifty thousand. So it does just kind of give you in our small sample size, uh, a window into the, the potential severity of these claims when they do become um, more critical and require more severe uh, medical services. Hey Mike, can, um, I, can I ask a question real quick? Um, it, thanks Kevin, I, I was curious, the $150,000 claim, was that, is that factored in with the average or is that? Is that it is. Okay, yeah. so then the, be interesting to see what the actual payouts and with 150 on one end, it makes me wonder probably the payout on the lower end is probably a lot less than the 3000. It certainly is. Um, and, and, and Zach, Zach and, and the reason for that is that many of these mild cases, you think about it, many of these mild cases, somebody is infected and they basically have to stay home uh, and self isolate for two weeks. And so, so yes, yeah, so many of these cases have may may not have uh, may have minimal uh, if no no medical expense and may not even have a wage expense if their employer is accommodating them in other ways for the the two week period so yes you're right uh, many of those are, are are much lower than that average those smaller it, claims do you you might get into this and sorry if I'm jumping the gun but what uh, do you know what the payout might look like if if somebody's if somebody dies of COVID uh, through, so, so uh, I, I think um, um, uh, Steve Monahan could probably speak to that a little better than me. But uh, but but no. But I, I would say it, it depends on the age of the indiv individuals uh, beneficiaries. Um, so there's there's a lot of different factors that would go into that decision on the compensation level. But um, uh, I think in, in the NCCI tool, uh, they estimated those severe cases to be just, just the, the, the um, fatality claim to be in the, in the neighborhood of 450,000. Thank you, Steve. Kevin, sorry. It's okay. Um, so uh, um, the, the chart at the top of page eight um, goes over the, um, again, this is the hypothetical tool. And I guess I'll just say to the committee is, you know, remember we had 156 claims. So it's up to the committee to decide how they wanna use the report that the department offers. But we really felt that that number of claims and to your questions, Zach, it, it's just, it's hard to make kind of real good assessments of, 
of the data of, of that small claim set. So we, were, we wanted to include the model because the model does contemplate these factors on a much larger scale. And um, uh, I, will say, I will say that the model, this model and other models will get revised over time. And, um, and that could, those revisions could result in maybe those severity levels being uh, contemplated at higher or lower levels, depending on data as, as time goes on. So, so, you know, remember the, that model that NCCI put together was probably put together by mid-April, late April. Um, so, you know, certainly we learn things weekly with this, uh, with this disease. Um, so I think those uh, updates will be forthcoming. I, th I think and I anticipate that we will see another update to that model probably, you know, early 21, if not sooner. Um, so what we, what we did is um, we looked at um, a couple different scenarios um, based on utilizing the model um, and scenario A in here uh, has a hospitalization rate of 10%. Um, and then of that, of that, those hospitalized, a critical care rate of 15%, a fatality rate of one half a percent, and then you'll see the average uh, COVID-19 claim costs. Um, and scenario B is just a more um, severe, uh, I won't say severe, but uh, it's not a mild uh, kind of um, uh, experience with COVID-19. Just, just for illustrative purposes, we wanted to provide that. But not just that. Um, um, workers' comp is is uh, is a long tail uh, a type of insurance. The the uh, so so that's just the nature of workers' comp, right? You have a workers' comp injury today. There may be a claim today, uh, but there may be longer term uh, effects, whether it's a physical injury or a um, or a, a, an, an infection like COVID nineteen. And those long-term effects may not present for decades. So, um, and we're learning with COVID-19 that there are several long-term health effects that can impact that. So we did wanna illustrate something that was higher than where we currently are, just so the committee can understand that should things develop that um, th these are what those impacts would be. So you can see the, the average claim cost goes up um, uh, to over 10,000 with scenario B. We did get input from the um, Intermunicipal Trust, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and they, they gave us some uh, information on the mild cases that, that they've experienced. Uh, and um, those um, claims range between 1,000 and 5,000. So fairly consistent with what we're seeing with the overall uh, state data. Obviously the wage replacement uh, benefits impact the, uh, the indemnification side. Um, and you can see the medical costs being between 100 and 2,500. So that's just an example that, you know, oftentimes these very mild cases are just self quarantine and maybe it's the, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, really very, very little if any medical expense. Um, and and uh, the next section three talks about the average cost of a severe fatal claim, um, and the overall average of that claim is five hundred and forty thousand. I think I said four fifty. Um, uh, it's five hundred and forty thousand. Um, um, which consists of um, yeah, five hundred and forty thousand, right? Um, which can, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Which consists of wage replacement, the death, the death benefit is actually four hundred seventy-five thousand. So to uh, uh, to the earlier question, um, I was relatively close. And then the medical costs of 64,000. Um, and then the, the impact on various um, 
um, uh, employment types um, um, can can also ha vary, um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, the, the next section on, on section one on page nine talks about the long tail. Um, and I just wanted to just reference in here some other data that was provided um, in, our, in our study. And it was from the, um, um, from the, the um, JAMA article on cardiology. And that found that 78 out of 100 people diagnosed with COVID-19 had cardiac abnormalities when the heart was imaged on average 10 weeks later. So that just is, gives you a, another insight into um, the early studies of this. And while we're still relatively early in the, in the, in the pandemic um, is showing some um, indication that there may be longer term health effects. Um, and those effects are uh, you know, it considered similar to what was experienced with SARS and, and MERS uh, with reduced lung capacity um, and uh, ability to exercise and, and mental health problems that can be related to this. Um, additionally, to just emphasize the long tail nature, uh, NCCI in a, in a paper in 2013 uh, estimated that 10% of the cost of medical benefits uh, for workplace injuries uh, will occur uh, uh, over the, the one or two decades post the injury. So, you know, there is 10% of the claims that will just present in, a, in that very long tail nature. Um, we also did work, look at workers' compensation deductibles. I don't, I don't spend a, a lot of time on it, um, but there certainly is the ability to have a deductible with your workers' comp policy. Uh, what we found was 9% of, uh, um, the NCC and NEIC study found 9% of total policies had a, de a deductible. Um, generally, those are larger entities that can, uh, can withstand that expense. So that percent in Vermont, I don't have specific, but my, my sense is it would be a little lower than that in Vermont than it would be on, in the, on, the, on a national level. Um, but that information is there for you to, for you to to see, um, you know, and and of those that, that have a deductible, um, uh, a, a little more than half have a deductible up to a hundred thousand, and then forty six percent have deductibles of greater than a hundred thousand. So again, those are lar large risks. And in looking at the the tool, the department utilized. Um, uh, uh, a number of uh, kind of captured a number of issues here with looking at that uh, of the tool. One was the assumption utilized in the modeling cost impacts, the predicted cost for those scenario models, uh, the impact on frontline workers and comp uh, comp compensability presumptions, uh, and the approach. Uh, uh, um, on frontline workers and experience rating. And then finally, the uh, reinsurance and potential COVID-19 related impacts. I will go through those. Um, so the assumptions used, um, in the NCCI tool, they assumed that 90% had mild, uh, mild symptoms, eight and a half percent had moderate and one and a half percent with uh, severe symptoms. In terms of hospitalization, critical care, and fatal rates, uh, the department assumed a 10% hospitalization rate. 15% uh, of those hospitalized required treatment in the intensive care unit or ventilation, and a half a percent fatal rate. And uh, these th those assumptions were not the department just um, picking those out of. Uh, we we actually engage with directly with the Department of Health on that to give kind of a, a fair uh, estimate of those. And so we, we, we did get input from the Department of Health. Um, in terms of compensability rate, um, 
the 75 percent of the first responders and healthcare workers and 25 percent of the total workforce uh, uh, would be uh, would have a compens would have compensability um, would 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 um, be entitled to to compensation uh, based on our presumptions. Um, and then the report rate. So a report rate is just when someone will report that they have an injury, right? They make that first report of injury to the Department of Labor. Uh, and we assume 40% report rate for the total workforce and 50% for first responders. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the, the, the math on this, but basically the point is that there's many, many folks are, uh, have COVID-19 or asymptomatic. So that's why the report rate's not going to be 100% because there's a large portion that are asymptomatic. So the two, uh, the two leading um, uh, COVID-19 models uh, estimate that the Vermont infection rate is between 1.1 and 1.8% of the population. Um, and, um, and one of the, those models predicted that this will raise, rise to 3% by November 1st. Um, so th that's why we use that scenario B just to account for what we've seen out there with, with those projections. Um, on page 12, the, pr the predict predicted cost impact, um, there's three sharp charts. One is for the total workforce, one for first responders, and um, Right. And um, one for healthcare workers. Um, so the average cost uh, for workers' compensation claims for um, the total workforce is sixty six hundred and thirteen. The average for um, first responders is just over seven thousand seven thousand sixty seven, and the average for um, Healthcare workers is $7,292. Um, I think some of that difference is intuitive. We did, we did look at the, um, the, um, the presumption in the bill, that, in the act that um, uh, makes those, some of that, those costs, potential costs rise. We also just see that the, the exposure for healthcare workers is slightly higher than that for even first responders. I'm gonna to go to the rates and the experience rating. Um, one of the things that the committee was concerned about is what the, uh, the impact of these claims will have on employers and the cost of workers' compensation insurance. So there were, um, the, the NCCI filed um, two, two rules. Uh, one was to identify COVID-19 related claims to create a code for COVID-19 related claims. And the other was to um, not include those claims in any experience rating that the employer would. So the, right now the employers uh, are not. And I think the last time I was in front of the committee, I was asked whether that, whether even though those um, claims will not affect an individual employer, will they affect the rates on an overall basis? And then ultimately kind of goes back to impacting the cost of all. Um, that's still being worked through with NCCI and their rating, but their initial um, um, their initial uh, guidance to us is that they didn't anticipate uh, any inclusion of any COVID-19 related impact for the upcoming rate filing because it's just too early. There's just not enough information for them to 
react and 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 uh, so when they file for the 4121 rates, uh, there won't be a COVID-19 uh, claim component in that in that rate filing. We also looked into uh, reinsurance and uh, the impact on solvency. And certainly um, that, uh, that can be particularly impactful uh, for, um, it can be for the commercial market or the self-insured market, but uh, to the extent of the, of the claims that we know in Vermont to date, I think the, the, um, the, the reinsurance is available to all, both the commercial market and the self-insured. I think the self-insured market relies more heavily on those reinsurance agreements to uh, create a vehicle to be able to, um, to um, manage those exposures. Um, so I think when you look at um, those retention limits, depending on uh, what, what the committee decides, on available funds that could have an impact on the cost of their reinsurance, depending on what their exposure will be um, for any of these potential reimbursements. So in terms of a special uh, fund, we did look at um, uh, some, some mechanisms that uh, exist that are cons being considered in other states. Um, and they did look, the, in Minnesota, they looked at a retention limit for self-insured uh, uh, of uh, 100,000. Um, and so we, we've illustrated on the bottom of page 19, um, Two retention limits. Um, One hundred thousand uh, is um, not insignificant. Um, so we we modeled something that was. Um, does someone have a question? No. Uh, we mo we modeled something uh, uh, half half as much with a fifty thousand uh, dollar retention, um, uh, because. We're not seeing at the volume of severe claims, so we wanted to just look at that as an option for the committee to consider. Um, and we just laid out um, how much funds would be needed to reimburse 20 claims. And then you might ask, well, how did we come up with 20 claims? Um, I think we just chose a, a number that we thought was conservative as to what we're gonna see in the near term. It, Arguably, it's unlikely we're going to see um, tw in excess of 20 severe claims before the end of 2020. Um, but I can't, I can't predict the future and what the flu season will bring and whether we have an effective vaccine. And so we just wanted to provide some conservatism as to what we estimated. So with a 50,000 retention limit, uh, the amount required for reimbursement would be $2 million. And at a hundred thousand retention limit, the amount would be uh, one million dollars. Um, so, what what uh, what the department is um, recommending for um, for commercial insurers? Uh, you know, those through the, the, uh, the, the normal markets um, um, is to impose, um, uh, imposing a, a $1 million or, or a half or a $500,000 retention limit. Um, at those retention limits, as you see from our data, it would probably uh, result in little or no requests for reimbursement. Um, and then for the, the, um, the self-insured uh, and the Intermunicipal Insurance Association, uh, we, we, would, um, we would recommend a retention limit of, uh, of 100,000, but we did illustrate the 50,000 uh, for the committee just so they could 
uh, look at the those options. If if the if the committee uh, decides to allocate uh, um, CARES Act monies, um, uh, we suggest that uh, there be a in statute a mechanism for reviewing the amount allocated in the fund by a specific date. And what we're getting at there is we don't see uh, you know an emergent um, request for reimbursement. But again, we won't know what the fall and the early winter will bring. Um, and we, uh, we, we thought it'd be good to have, uh, if, you're, if you're going to earmark funds for this potential reimbursement, that, um, that those funds could be um, unencumbered uh, on a date that you choose, we're suggesting November 15th. And what we're saying is if, if, you're, if it's looking like little or no funds have been accessed, uh, and you allocated, let's say, two million dollars, that you might want to un unencumber a million of those at you know year end minus forty five days. But that's just something for the committee to consider. Um, we did look at the you know what the what the reinsurance um, uh, impacts may be here. Uh, we just it, it's it's difficult to really tease and assess all those. I think reinsurers are also looking at this data and, and how they will respond. Um, but we just didn't have the sufficient time to evaluate that fully, but certainly uh, we'll, we'll be in regular engagement with these parties that we engage with during the study uh, to see if those trends develop, if there's reinsurance availability issues or pricing issues. We always want to be sensitive to those. And we usually will we'll get feedback uh, from, those, uh, from those parties uh, if there is a market issue, um, but that's something we can continue to monitor. Um, I think I'll stop there and um, allow the committee to ask any questions. Um, any questions of Kevin? believe that was pretty thorough, Kevin. Thank you and um, your staff, all the staff for, and every department that worked with you on this um, to put this together for us. Uh, it's much appreciated. Lynn? Yeah, in the very beginning, you talked about the number of Vermonters that have been affected. I got to find it here. It was 0.24%. And you said that the uh, the model said there was going to be, it should be 2%. There was a big discrepancy there. Did, does anybody? Um, yes. What, what yep. causes that discrepancy? No, no, that's a good observation. And that, and we, and we state that in the report, uh, you know, that the, and the, and the reason for that is that we, we didn't feel like, um, and I, I think I may have expressed this when, when we were asked to undertake the study is that it, it, it may be challenging to come up with conclusions on kind of actions. Cause I think our, we felt our charge was to make, to provide the committee with some tools to make decisions on whether to set aside funds and to rely on the reports between um, when reports came in perhaps in um, April Late April, May timeframe through August um, solely was was going to be a weakness in providing some considerations. When we knew that the the modeling that NCCI is has used and what that model kind of co contemplates, we felt that was a more reliable parameter. I think I even may have testified to this previously to the committee that our sense is that. Uh, Vermont will likely come out below that two percent level, right? Mm -hmm. But um, to what to what degree below? It just was difficult to 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 make that decision. We, I, we felt like we had um, we feel like we're at that low end of the range, but most likely below. Um, but it's hard to know where we're going to end up. All right. Thank you.
Any other questions for Kevin? Okay. Charlie. Yeah, I wasn't sure, uh, Mr. Chair, to be honest, because thinking about the return to school, potential number of increases of cases uh, coming from the school system for someone saying that I contracted COVID-19 at school, um, if that 0.2 going up to 2% suddenly becomes more believable. Uh, but the, the set aside, uh, your recommendation is to, um, to allocate some funds and put them aside that could be reallocated by the end of the month, uh, end of the year, I'm sorry, December 20th, uh, and setting up a fund possibly. I read through it, uh, uh, is it the administration's uh, opinion that that is a wise, policy choice now, Kevin, or is it something that um, we don't need to do at this point? I think, uh, you know, I think we're, 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 we're trying to respond to the committee who is considering to set, set aside a fund. Um, yeah. Um, I don't think we make the decision on whether that's done or not. I mean, I think we lay out kind of where Vermont is currently, right? You have the, the snapshot of where we are. I think you do lay out some potential changes in our mobility and return to school and return to higher education and, 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 and perhaps influx of, uh, of, out of more out of state activity and a whole host of, of things that, um, are difficult to to anticipate um so i think we are, we are recommending that if if you're if you i mean it, it's really if you're going to decide on setting aside funds that this this hopefully provides you with the, the mechanism to make that decision okay, thank you yeah. any other questions for kevin Hey, thank you, Kevin. Thank I, you I guess, much. I guess, can I just maybe stay one more thing on that? Sure. I, I will say that, as you know, we did, we did kind of bifurcate our evaluation of the marketplace between the commercial market and the self-insureds and the intermunicipal trusts. And, and, you know, from a, from a, from a solvency standpoint and from uh, what those um, mechanisms provide in the state, particularly if you're talking about the uh, some of the intermunicipal trusts that provide benefits to many of the more prominent uh, exposure type occupations, frontline workers, um, um, those mechanisms are more um, can can be more greatly impacted by a, an uptick in these exposures. So, if you're uh, and, and if you see how we've laid it out, I think the retention limits really establish a, um, a level that most likely the benefits would go to those more, more vulnerable markets. And that was, you know, with design, knowing that what their kind of purpose is and role. So I think if the committee is going to consider that just to, just to focus in on that, on, on that component of the report. Yeah, one last question. When you talk about creating the special fund and that the recommendation with CRF or the department's recommendation is for use CRF funds for this, um, for the special fund money, does that mean that that qualifies it to be used for the, be done with it and be implemented by the end of the year? I mean, these are this is tail money from what I understand. Uh, when, what, what was your last, this is what kind of money? Money for the tail. I mean, it won't be used necessarily if there's a tail for these extra um, first responders, for instance. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, yeah, I know, I understand the, the comment. Um, yeah, so that's right. The, 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 the tail, the long tail exposure here is, is likely not going to be served by this fund. Right, right, because many of these things may present after 2020. So they do have to be expended in 2020. And, that, and that's why we put in, we suggested a, um, a date closer to the end of the year where you might have better insight. School will be in, 
already be in session for a solid two months, um, you can then assess whether you unencumber, uh, you know, 50% or more of those funds so that they can be used um, elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions for Kevin? Great, Kevin, thank you. You're welcome. Steve, how are you? Good morning, or perhaps good afternoon. Yeah, we're a little over now, so it's afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking time to listen in and, and to speak with us today. Yeah, uh, I'm, for the record, I'm Steve Monahan, Director of Workers' Compensation and Safety for the Vermont Department of Labor. Um, and I don't have a lot to add specifically um, to the report. I can say, that, um, well, to, to my knowledge, and Kevin may know better, the administration hasn't actually decided whether this is a good idea. Um, this is just, if we were to go this route, this is what this would look like. Um, and I, one part of me uh, suspects that um, since the money has to be expended before the end of the year, that we simply won't have enough Claims. I, I mean, I do have uh, some concerns because um, for the most part, we have been through a period of very little social mobility. And now, particularly with colleges and students back, that seems to be where uh, rapid increases around the country have occurred and, and in schools opening up uh, as if, if people become more mobile and more social, there may be an increase. I don't. I don't know. Um, we have received 100, as of this morning, 180 first reports of injury related to COVID, but 136 of those have been denied essentially because they were reports of possible exposure, but there's never been any diagnosis or positive test result and therefore no injury. Um, the remaining claims are primarily um, relatively small. They may have involved uh, up to two weeks of temporary total. Uh, we have one case that I believe has involved hospitalization and that may get more expensive. We do have um, a couple of cases where people seem to be in that long term of testing positive. Um, now the health department has advised us that I think it's after a certain number of weeks, they may no longer, they may still test positive, but they may no longer be contagious and could return to work. Uh, that has not happened in part because one of the requirements I had put in place was that your return to work offer has to be able to inform the employee and the other employees what's being done to protect people from transmission and the offers that have come out have not addressed those factors. Um, so those people are still receiving temporary total. Um, and we have no information at the moment on what any long term effect or permanent impairment might be. And so that's pure guesswork at this point. Um, I can tell you that the lion's share of the claims, uh, both exposure only and uh, accepted claims, involve uh, either municipal police, fire, emergency workers, uh, state troopers, corrections, mental health employees, or employees of, in the healthcare sector, often connected with uh, nursing homes and those types of places. Um, and so I would second um, Kevin Gaffney's suggestion that the, the real impact may be on um, insurance trusts like Visbit or the League of Cities and Towns or those types of things, or, or even the state system where there's where the payout is coming for those self-insureds. Um, 
and UVM Medical Center is self-insured. Central Vermont Medical Center is self-insured. Most of the nursing homes, uh, those types of facilities, residential care facilities, are through private insurance. So there could be an impact there. But it's what I can tell you in a, in a nutshell. I think, you give me a moment. It was earlier some question about what if it was a cause. I think, Representative Watson, what was your question? <laughs> Uh, I, I had asked about the, the cost of if somebody dies, which um, which Kevin was able to answer. Um, so you might not be thinking of my question. Oh, yeah, well, I, I sort of was if you wanted some actual numbers. I, uh, cer certainly, yeah. Th thank you, Steve. I had um, plugged in, for example, if you had a nurse, that would be a high earner whose average weekly wage was say 3,600 or so, which would mean that their maximum comp rate, compensation rate would be only a 1,350 a week. Um, so let's say they were sick, they were out, the positive diagnosis, sick, admitted to the hospital in May, the condition deteriorates, um, and they pass away middle of June. Um, and if they have a 45 year old spouse and two children ages 10 and 12, in that, in that claim, the nurse would have received 13 weeks of temporary total disability or 17,500 roughly. Um, they would be payment of the funeral benefit up to $10,000. And then the spouse and two children would be receiving compensation at the maximum rate or 76% uh, until the children reach age 18 or no longer enrolled in education. Um, the spouse is guaranteed benefits until age 62 if eligible for social security or until remarried, but a minimum of 330 weeks. So the spouse doesn't remarry and is eligible, they'll get uh, about $1,196,050. Um, it would be somewhat higher because there is a COLA that gets applied annually. Um, and it's difficult to determine what what benefit the children receive. If they had turned 18 and be out of college, then that million would have covered them. If the spouse maxed out prior to that, they would then collect until they were uh, 18 or out of college or other educational program. So a fatality would cost, in addition to what the claimant received prior to their dying and the medical expenses, uh, at least one million one hundred ninety-six thousand, uh, possibly higher. So, as you can see, that that is expensive, although it is over times time in that case. And there is also, you know, the that's the the dollar figure. There's an enormous emotional um, impact on a family that may result in much uh, more costly uh, costs for uh, other types of care that would not be picked up by the workers' comp system. You know, including was this was the deceased spouse the source of medical insurance, those types of things. So, so there are a lot of costs here. So there's a lot of workers' comp costs as well as social costs. That's, that's why you hear me in previous testimony talking about the importance of prevention first, so you don't have to sit down and calculate this out. Are there any other questions or? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I did send you a copy you on a bulletin that I'd sent to the insurers. I want to 
make sure that you'd receive that so you knew what the department was doing after the passage of Act 150. I believe I did see that and I'll try to dig it up and get it to the committee. Or I may have already sent it to Amy, I'm not sure. Um, thank you, Steve, appreciate it. I, I think at this point, um, it may be prudent for us to just keep track of what's going on out there to see if there's more, if we start seeing more uh, cases developing um, without putting any money into a fund right now. Um, there will be a mechanism for the Joint Fiscal Committee to be able to um, move funds around um, that, that come back um, of COVID funds. Um, so I, I think that may be a, a good process for us to think about and an area where we would, um, we would be interested in Joint Fiscal putting money if it came to that, um, came to that uh, point. Any other thoughts of committee members? Okay. Well, we're at 1220. We're a little bit ahead of time. So I think we, um, I think we've completed our work for today. Um, remember we're have a caucus of the whole at two o'clock. Um, I think the, be going through the budget so there may be some questions uh, for us um, out there and then at three o'clock we're on the floor so I think with that I um, appreciate Kevin uh, and Steve for being with us um, Damien thank you for listening in and thank you to um, to all that were were uh, from our business groups and labor groups um, that have been with us today. We appreciate it. And as soon as we have a, a time, a date from Department of Labor um, to continue discussions on the trust fund, then we will uh, get back in touch with you and, and uh, invite you in with us. So with that, thank you, everyone. Um, have a good afternoon.